Hey everyone, welcome back to Land Investing Online, where we teach students how to profitably buy and sell vacant land. This is the simplest, least competitive, and most profitable sector of real estate. For more information, visit landinvestingonline.com. Join our free Discord. Ron and I are involved in a ton of other successful investors. Come learn from the best. I'm Daniel Apke, joined again by my brother and business partner, Ron Apke. Welcome back, Ron. Hey, Dan. Good to be here. Before we start, uh, today's topics, five tips to guarantee land investing success from what we see with our members and what we've seen from, from our experience as well. We're going to dive into that. But before we do that, let's go over one of our questions. So the question is, I'm not happy with my realtor. They've posted it up three months ago and we're not getting a lot of traction and I don't think they're doing their job. What should I do? Yeah, this is a this is a hard situation. So you said three months, Dan? And that's a long time that someone's been working on a property. Um, we prefer having uh, land sold within three months. So if they haven't done much in three months and you don't have the leads, like definitely check in with them. Like I think the first thing you need to do, and I'm not the best at this to be 100% honest, because I do get frustrated. And then I kind of will overreact sometimes when someone's not a good, doing a good job or what I expect. Um, but I think the first thing to do is having a conversation with them uh sometimes they'll get real sensitive about it and just say they're doing what they can that's whatever they'll blame it on the land um and then you take it further after that um but be honest with them let them know hopefully if it's a six-month contract if you're already three months in a six-month contract be upfront with them let you let them know your expectations which you should have done at the beginning hopefully you did but obviously realtors change and then i, I would let the contract go out if it's only a six-month contract if they can't sell it then um ask them why they think it's not selling ask them what they what we need to do to sell don't just have them lower the price like make sure they're marketing in the correct spots but yeah i mean we have high expectations of our realtors so it does happen quite a bit with us where we have to have those uh conversations with them but uh i think the first thing is being honest and upfront yeah i agree um so it's kind of set expectations with them see what's going on the the first thing i would do before even talking to them I would I would just check on you know MLS sites so like Zillow, Realtor, com. Make sure it's on there. Make sure it looks good. Make sure they have a decent description. Then go to the land networks. Check if it's on land.com and those. Um, make sure it has a good description, contact info, all that stuff. Because then when you're talking to them and you're touching base, be like, I couldn't, I didn't find it on um, on the MLS. Did you list it or whatever the case may be? Um, or if there's only one picture, then you can say, hey, it's not marketed properly, and do that. But another thing to do, depending, so if they do have one picture and it's not listed in the appropriate spots and you don't think they're putting time into it, they've never been to the property, if things are very bad, you can get out of these. You really can. Um, I, I, I think you can almost get out of any contract personally with a realtor if you put up enough fight because they just don't want to deal with it. But you you don't tell the real... First, you go to the realtor and tell them you want out of the contract. And this is kind of extreme. Don't do this every time. If, if you're if you're questioning your realtor, have that conversation like Ron said, but there's times where you're going to see this and just be like, wow, I screwed up. I didn't do enough you know, due diligence on this realtor. I need to get out of this contract. I need this money. It's $150,000 and this guy's not going to sell it. And then you have to go to the realtor, be honest with them, say you're not meeting my expectations. I want out of the contract, whatever it is. And then if they put up a fight, you're going to have to go to their broker. And we've done this before. And I have friends that are realtors who say it happens all the time. It's nothing It's nothing like they haven't seen, but you're going to have to go around them, go to their broker, because that's ultimately who has the say and who's in charge of the contracts. Um, so if it's bad enough, I wouldn't be scared to do that. Who cares? Like worst case scenario, they fight it and then you're stuck with them another three months. But best case scenario, you're out of it and it's a win-win for everyone. Um, but that's enough on that topic. Ron, do you have any last comments on that? No, that's a, that's a good point, Dan. And, uh, yeah, ho hopefully, hopefully this doesn't happen too often. You can do your due diligence prior, but you, it's going to happen at some point. So this is good for everyone, no matter where you're, where you are in your career. It's a big, big learning experience, and it's it's a big ego kill to those realtors. They don't like to hear that they're not doing their job well. But at the end of the day, like put more than one picture up and put some effort in it. These clowns just sometimes don't know how to do their job, and it's really frustrating. Um, so I understand. But let's get into the show, guys. Five tips to guarantee land investing success. So what have we seen from our practice and our students and members 
um, of what what really guarantees their success. Long, we're looking long term sustainability here. We're not looking success two months. Like, what's gonna in three years? Are you gonna be on top or you know ahead of everyone else, or where are you gonna be? So this is really a sustainability thing. Um, and if you do these things, it doesn't guarantee immediate success. It guarantees long term success. I think immediate success. There's a lot of variables in there. Um, Ron and I didn't make good money for six months or so. Um, some people do it quicker, some people do it longer, but there's just so many variables. So let's get into that. Tip one, step one to guarantee success. And you hear us say this one all the time. You got to send enough mail. What do you have to say about that, Ron? Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. Um, I think mail, I think having this topic as mail in general. So I look at more consistency than the volume. Um, so it, that's that's your business, honestly. That is how we acquire there are other ways to acquire land. You can try to make a bunch of offers on market and try to get them under market value, but you're just not going to get good deals then. Um, mail is the way you are going to get land for 30 to 40 to 50% of market value. Um, and you need to be consistent with your schedule or your deal flow is going to be screwed up. So the topic is what we, how you guarantee success, essentially. If you're not consistent with your mail, you're not going to guarantee anything. Uh, you're not going to get as much deals. You're not going to have deal flow. Um, you're going to have these weird dry spells where nothing comes in. Once you send your first mailer, you need to have your second one scheduled and ready to go. You cannot say, I'm getting a bunch of calls. I want to get my first deal first. Um, if you do that, okay, fine. Um, you're doing proof of concept and all that, but it's going to delay things. Um, and then it's going to also like you need to be bought in and be have a schedule before you send your first mailer. Like I want to send this mailer, then my next mailer here. And then there might be a stopping point. Like if it's not working, it's not working. But uh, whatever, have a schedule. I agree. And um, shout out to our brother, Mike, on this. He's done a really good job of staying consistent early on when he hasn't seen a return yet. Um and granted, he only started a couple months ago. I think he sent out his first mail or maybe a month and a half ago. So I think he's waiting on some purchase agreements back in the mail. Um, but he hasn't he hasn't seen a profit yet. And he continues. I saw he uploaded more mail yesterday or the day before, and he's continuing to do that. And I'm telling you, that stuff is going to pay off. It's going to pay off big time. Ron and I, I think it was 20 something thousand mailers we sent before we got our first uh, deal back that I have not seen any numbers as high as we had. That just tells you um, we, it took us a very long time to get this down, but we stayed consistent with it no matter what. And it really, really pays off. And, Number and we two. got deals from all those. And we got deals from all those mailers. I don't want you guys to think we sent 20,000 without any deals. We got deals from them, but we consistently were sending two to 3000 every single week. Um, so that it just, it, it, it piled on so fast. And then we had a bunch of deals and we kept sending the mail and it just, it, it snowballed really fast for us in a good way. Yeah. And I'm trying to think we got a deal recently and it was like, I don't know if we're going through with the purchase or not. Um, but I got emails and it was over a year ago that we sent the mailer and I was getting emails and they sent me a purchase agreement and it was from like a, a, a year ago. So these mailers pay off and it doesn't always come now. I think Ron shared a story on one um, someone else who does land, um, who stopped sending mail and then like eight months later or something, they got a $90,000 deal back, two of them or something like that. Like it was just mm -hmm. crazy, crazy numbers that they did. And it wasn't for nine months. So staying consistent, the deals will come work on, um, well, that brings us to number two. I won't even say it then. Number two is always work on your pricing. Um, so Ron, I'll let you do that. You're the pricing guy here. Yeah. Um, uh, <clears throat> it's something that, uh, I constantly am working on it and adjusting. I try to be as transparent with our students as possible for what I'm doing at the moment because things change. But at the end of the day, like <clears throat> you got to be able to price different ways. We con we do these uh, uh, these 15 minute consultations and they they're awesome. I really enjoy doing them and talking to prospective students. Um, and they're constantly asking like different questions, different ways to go around things. Should I send priced mail? If I join them, I'm, I constantly tell them like, yes, you need to price. There's other softwares that quote unquote price for you. And I had a conversation the other day about this. Um, and I, it's just not the same. And you need to be able to price yourself and you need to be able to adjust based on the market 
uh, just based on other strategies coming. You need to be able to be more precise when you need to. For counties with a ton of data, you need to be able to price more, uh, more precisely. For counties with less data, you can be a little more broad and there probably isn't as much competition there. It's probably not as hot of a market, but uh, it, it's a big part. I don't wanna get too deep in this, but pricing is a huge part of our business. You don't have to be some crazy data person or Excel person. We do use data and we do use Excel, but uh, it, it's something you need to be able to adapt with and improve as we go, as you go. Yeah, and a big part of that, like Ron and I talk about specializing in certain stuff and a big part of pricing is understanding the areas where you are. Um, so the more knowledge you have about that area, the more efficiently you can price um, and you just know the area better. I mean, it's there's so many variables that come down to pricing. It's just you constantly have to be looking back. How did you price it? I remember looking when Ron and I first started, like I remember looking through and testing for reason um, and we were pricing like 18 percent in some hot areas. And that just is not going to fly. But we learned that it's not going to fly and adjusted it. But it was literally like, I remember seeing that 18% and it would be like these hot areas that are growing, um, like areas in Tennessee around Nashville and stuff. And we were at 18%. And we did get a couple properties actually, um, most likely. But it's just, it's not, that business model is not going to work and it's not sustainable. Continue to tweak your pricing. Number three, Outsource task and hire. So obviously this one's not for if you're just starting. You don't need to outsource any task. First step is learn the task yourself. Then once you have enough experience and you're getting sick of those tasks and it's just tedious, then go ahead, outsource and hire. Ron, what do you have to say about this one? Yeah, I mean, I don't think this is with the title. Uh, I agree as far as if you really want to make some money. Um, but as far as guaranteeing success, I don't think this is 100% necessary. Um, and, uh, Dan came up with this list. Um, after we go through a five, I'll let you guys know if I have anything else to add. Um, Daniel's real big on outsourcing and like, it makes your life much easier. If you're able to make money doing this by yourself and be very profitable, you add someone to it, you can put in more time into whatever sales or sending mail or whatever it is that you're good at. Um, and we just had an episode on this, how to hire your first employee whether it's a VA from somewhere overseas or if it's a, uh, someone in the States who's a little more pricey, but they also can do a lot more. Um, it, it's a huge for scalability. If you want to scale, you 100% need to do this. If you're trying to be successful, uh, you can do this by yourself, in my opinion, Dan. Yeah, you definitely can be successful um, doing this yourself. But like I said, we're talking about sustainability here. Gotcha. I don't know how sustainable it is doing all. You can. I just, you, it's going to be hard to scrub data for three straight years. I just, <laughs> maybe you're that type of guy, but it's just, this business model has so many different moving parts and pieces. There's going to be something you absolutely can't stand. I almost guarantee that or something you're not good at or just hate. Um, and no, I, I don't think this is to guarantee your success outsourcing task and hiring, to be honest. It's more a sustainability thing and it's more to grow. Um, that's like, you, you can't get huge. Like you can't have $20 million of profit a year doing it yourself. You can have one, $1 million easily profit yourself. I think if you're working this full time and you're grinding one, 2 million will be hard to do yourself. It might be almost impossible unless you're doing really big deals and really efficient. You could do it. Um, 2 million plus profit wise, even like 1.5 million plus, I don't think you're going to have enough manpower to do it all yourself. So if you want to be that next, next level, you're going to have to outsource and hire. And then it's going to take your business to the next level. I mean, there's multiple reasons to hire. I could go on and on and on and on. Anyone in business knows the name of the game is hiring good, surrounding yourself with good people. Um, yep. That's all I have to say. Do you have I, anything to add? Yeah, I think it's a, uh, sorry, I just blocked my camera. <laughs> um, I think it's a, uh... It's got to be a mind sh mindset shift, guys. Like Daniel and I, like I don't think you can do much more than 1.5 million by yourself, personally. Like Daniel said, um, Daniel and I, as ourselves, um, like we would cap right about two million, and then we you just need to hire. Um, even now, with all of our experience, like I think Daniel and I would have a trouble just us two breaking two two and a half million. Um, it's got to be a mindset mindset shift. Um, tongue twister. It's got to be a mindset shift that you want to grow bigger than what you can by yourself, um, that you're not paying someone, you're investing in your company. 
and they're they're obviously getting a salary or whatever an hourly rate uh that mindset shift it really changes things it helped me a lot daniel's done this in the past um, i've done it in the past in terms of hiring some um, but not to this uh not this much so we, we're constantly adding to our team it's hard at first because you got to train someone for three months maybe maybe six months and then you're still not they're still not going to have the same intensity and passion about the business even if they're getting commission and everything but they are going to help grow the business they're going to be able to give you time to do more valuable tasks uh so th that's just got to be the mindset in my mind then yeah i agree 100 percent. and there's i met with one guy a few weeks ago who just he seems to like it all doing himself or and or he thinks managing someone else is more brutal than actually doing the task, which is fine. You can make an incredible, incredible living. I know I'd say almost probably 70 to 80 percent of our students and people who do this full time do it by themselves. Managing and hiring is not easy and it's scary. But like Ron said, if you want to take it to the next level, you got to get over that hurdle and get it done and hire. Mm -hmm. um, so number four, I had originally sell properties fast and turn your money. So sell properties fast and turn your money. But I'm going to change this into just managing cash flow. This no matter no matter how big you grow, right? Our profit can be five million dollars a year. But managing that cash flow and that profit is so important because I've explained this before. As you grow, you're going to have so many properties for sale and you're going to have so many properties you're buying, right? If you're buying a lot more properties than you have for sale because you're growing, right? So that side's stacking up and you're only selling, you know, three quarters of that, you're going to run out of cash. So you have to find ways to manage your cash flow. And I'm reading a book right now, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, the founder of Nike. And he has this, it's so interesting. I'm listening to it at this point in my life because we have a cash flow issue. We're just plowing it back into properties. And yes, our assets are outstanding right now. And I feel very good. But banks look at this as risk, right? So you kind of have to shift from being a biased business owner to like how, you know, look from a 30,000 foot point of view and look at how banks and analysts will look at this business. Yes, it's all in assets, but we're cash light. You know, once we buy all those properties, we our cash might dwindle down to 5% of what our annual sales are, whatever it is. Um, so he had the same issues with cash flow and the bank saw this and he goes all into how he was so confident he would sell any shoe that came in his door, but he couldn't get enough money to buy more shoes. And that's what the whole book is. And that's what his whole struggle was in business early on. And that's our struggle as well. Once you get to that point, you got to find a way to get two to $5 million. If you want to scale, like, how are you going to get, I'm 27 runs going on 30 here. It's not banks don't look at us and just hand you $2 million or $5 million. It's hard. So you have to find a way to manage your cash flow. It really should probably be number two on this list. It is extremely important for growth. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, I don't, I'm not looking at these five in any order, Dan. Um, I'm going to look at it in a little different light. Um, you got to treat it like a business. Um, and that's what this is. And that's what we constantly are kind of teaching our students and telling our students. This isn't like a quick cash scheme. It's not nothing like that. Don't sell a property and make $20,000 on your first property, then go buy a car. Um, that's part of managing cash flow. Don't overpay yourselves. Like you need to reinvest your money into mail more so. Partner on deals, reinvest your money in, and I'm going to take this from a beginner perspective, assuming you don't have a ton of backup cash to buy land with. Um, so you get that first money, you're excited. Do Like I said, do not pay yourself and go, whatever, buy a car or put 20,000 extra dollars down on your house or something like that. Um, get it and reinvest in the business. You, you prove the process or you prove the system. You prove that this is, uh, that this works to yourself. Manage your cap, manage your cash flow is so important. And that for those first five to 10 deals, Dan, where they're going to make five to 10 deals, you're going to make anywhere between a hundred to $250,000. It could be more, it could be less depending on your deal size. Um, but you need to know what to do with that, uh, profit. Put that back in the mail. Maybe you have a really good deal that you want to buy yourself. Do that. But you don't want to ever see your bank account go below whatever, five or $10,000 once you get that flow going. Because so, that five or $10,000 is going to pay for ten to 20,000 mailers. Um, so really think about that. I think 
being able to pay for the next mailer, assuming that next mailer is going to fail. I know that's kind of a pessimistic mindset, Dan. And uh, I always kind of look at things when I do that. Um, not that we're not in position to pay for our mail, um, but uh, being able to making sure that assuming that next mailer is going to fail and be able to continue doing the business. Hopefully you have some properties for sale. Mm -hmm. And then once you grow, like Daniel said, it's really important. You, you're going to have so much for sale. Um, one of the things, Dan, I think that we didn't, you talked about properties selling, I guess that was your initial thing. Um, you need to have, you need to get those properties marketed and not selling underpriced or anything like that, but you need them marketed really well, really fast. Um, I think that in itself will help manage your cash flow. Yeah. And you can, you can get your money back in, in two months or you can, or, uh, six weeks, or you can get it back in four to six months. So market those correctly the day they go up. That's, I mean, that's just turning your cash, but you'll get to a point where you're selling, you know, I'm trying to think from a beginner's, I'm thinking high level and run. I'm glad you adjusted my kind of thought there um, to more of a beginner's mindset, but you'll get to a point early on where, you know, maybe you have $150,000 worth of properties you're selling and you have 148,000 that you're buying and you need to just dump that right back in, which is fine, but you have to, and that's what we did a lot. And we didn't pay ourselves a lot either early on. But depending on what you want to do, um, I, I almost rather buy 120000 Now looking back, I'd almost rather buy $120,000 worth of those properties that you're buying and keep 30000 cash reserve for mail and other things if they don't go right. You have to look at some risk. And we didn't do this early on. And you're so biased on the business model. I know it's going to work, whatever. But just plowing them back because it never stops and you just keep doing it. And you got to find a way to kind of split cash and keep cash in the bank for reserves, for mail, for paying yourself. Maybe you want to buy, like Ron and I are buying a commercial property right now and we need hundreds of thousands of dollars of cash. Um, so what we're doing, we're just taking a certain percentage um, of our sold properties that we're selling and just putting it aside for this commercial property reserve. Um, there's different ways to do it. There's a lot better people out there than I am with managing cash. I'm um, sure there's a ton of people listening to this who are very good with financing, accounting. So do what works for you, I guess. We're not professionals in this area at all, but you just have to you have to find a way to get it done. Anything exactly. to add to that, Ron? No, I think let's go to number five. All I got to say to end that is just have a plan. Have a cash flow plan. Don't just go in, like I said, treat it like a business, but uh, let's go on to number five, Dan. Number five is continual education and learning. Get involved. So one of our core values at our company is um, continual education, right? So we're really big into this. Personal and professional development is what we always say to our employees and our as our company. Um, and if you're listening to this, good job. You're already doing it. Just <clears throat> like we're talking about sustainability here. Think long term. Do this, you know, maybe for a year, you're listening to podcasts straight or six months or whatever it is, you have to continue to learn and grow professionally, personally, all that stuff. Continue to get yourself in the discords. Ron and I did a really, really good job. And we see the very successful members do this consistently for a long time because there is always something to learn. And also another whole part of that's networking, right? The more people you know in this industry or similar industries, the better it is. Um, Ron, I'll let you take over. No, I think that's really good. Um, I don't have a ton to add to that. I think that's why, like, how much we believe in this. So this is our land flipping business that we're saying, like, that's one of our core values is continual education. And the, how strongly Dan and I both believe in this is why we are constantly adding to our course. Because um, I know from a, a student perspective, like, you guys want to keep being able to learn from us. Obviously, the, these podcasts are helpful, um, but we are constantly adding to our course because things change. And I had written down on here adaptability, Dan, as something with being successful in a business. I think this adds to it. Like if you're educating yourself, you're going to hopefully be able to take action and be adapt, adapt to the changing markets um, right now. And we'll, we have podcasts, it might have came out already um, on the real estate market. Like things are going to change. Strategies are going to change in this. And then going on the other stuff, like personally, you need to continue to edu educate yourself as well. Not everything is about business or this. Daniel, Daniel really strongly believes this, and I, I do as well, um, as far as like having your whole life, as far as just a balance. Uh, it can't just be all one thing. And continually learn and educate yourself about whatever you're passionate about outside of business and that I think it's really important as well. 
Yeah, definitely um, have personal, like same thing with like goal setting, right? Personal goals and then professional goals. Where we're, Like I said three, four times in this podcast, we're talking about sustainability here. You can go all in and work 80 hours a week um, and you know go all in for land flipping and not sleep at night. But are you going to be able to do that three years from now? Like, let's, let's mm-hmm. talk about that. Like, I think it's great when people are hustling. I love to work hard. I like to always, my mind's constantly around business and stuff, but you got to have a break and you got to do some things you enjoy for that three to five year plan. We're, we're talking sustainability here, guys. But any, any last comments on any of those, Ron, um, before we close out? No, I think that's really good. Hopefully you guys took some notes during this. Um, this is all from personal experience from us, as well as seeing our students. Um, we've obviously, we, we have a bunch of students. We've had people succeed and we've had people that don't follow this and just struggle, honestly, when they, when they whatever, all these five things. So going back on that, Dan, we had consistent mail or just mail in general, improving your pricing in that system, outsourcing tasks and hiring managing cash flow and continual education. Like I really think those five things, um, and that's the name of this podcast, guaranteeing su- success. If you do this and uh, you keep learning and all that, I think you're going to be successful. I don't and that's really possible. like, this is all like a life thing. Any business, this besides the mail, like we're talking about send enough mail and working on your pricing. Those are the two things that t- turn the needle the most. But maybe you have a service car wash industry. What what's gonna help you the most getting people to that car wash and change number one and two? But like outsourcing task and hire, um, and then turning your money and managing cash flow is the name of the game in any business. And then continue education and learning will just help you get through life. So this is all business stuff right here. It's not just necessarily related to land. Um, other than that, guys, that's all we have to say on that. If you're listening on app or on Spotify or Apple or podcast. Please give us, um, rate us and like us, subscribe to the channel. If you're on YouTube, a subscription really helps this channel grow. We see what you guys want and get more involved in the community and really adapt from what our feedback is on that. So please like and subscribe to the channel. Also visit landinvestingonline.com. Join our Discord. Ron and I are involved. Come say hi. There's tons of successful investors in there. Come learn from the best. See you guys next week. Thanks, guys.